Hello there everybody. Hope everybody's well and your families are good and these are getting used to the Groundhog Day that we find ourselves in now. <laughs> but uh, welcome to Gav's Shacklety of Engineering. <laughs> I've done a few videos now, I'm starting to kind of get into it a little bit. Uh, Depending on what time of day, it's maybe quite hard to see at times. So, hopefully you'll be able to see that. I can see the lights causing a bit of a problem. Uh, right. Well, it's been a bizarre time. And, I don't know about you, but I've been eating lots of food. <laughs> food shortages. No in this house. <laughs> and, uh, just we try to get all my things. Try to teach the kids. No, try to teach the, my wee ones as well. It's uh, try to make up wee things. But it's good. It's been actually quite a good experience to spend a lot of time with your kids and that. We are, and the messages, I suppose. Uh, aye, it's been good. <laughs> right. Now. There's only like nine weeks to go, but don't panic. You don't panic till you see me panic, right? So everything's cool. Everything's cool. Uh, I'll need you to kind of complete those three phase tutorials I've sent you. And if some of you are struggling with it, to get back to me, please. And what I'll maybe do is. I'll do a tutorial with a couple of kind of similar examples. Uh, I want you to get the vector thing and that. And uh, also, I still I need you to do a tiny wee like four hundred word report or something on the generation of three phase electricity and do a wee graph showing the different phases and. Uh, I want you to include a capacitor over the circuit, but uh, what I will do is I will, the next day or two, I will do an example of that and I will upload it, the wee video, and then you can get back to me with that. And please, if anybody needs me to help them with this, with the, the tutorials, because I need to have a uh, evidence of what you've done and, it, and we, we, we can only do it by tutorials and I need to get that from you so I can pass you basically and there's still a couple of things that people need to do from term one and uh, yep that's that so it's not really a lot of work to get that sorted, I think. Now, we've got cable ratings and protection devices and test and measurement again. I'm not sure how to proceed with that. I've got a, I managed to procure, <laughs> I done like a smash and grab from the lab before the day we shut down, I got an oscilloscope a signal generator and uh, meters and circuits and stuff so we can have a try our best to to look at measurement I'm, I know uh, Ross sent me an email so you've done all this kind of before there is a lot of repetition between these uh, these courses and anyway I think We'll go through a bit of testing. I'll video myself doing some testing and I'll give you a couple of tutorials and that'll probably be it to be honest. So that'll be easy, right? Don't have to worry too much about that. Cable ratings and protection devices, it's uh, it's, it's actually quite interesting. And what I'll do with that is I'll do the same kind of thing I'll I'll give you three or four tutorials 
or sort of four main tutorials or something like that. And that should be that. And we could get that through that in a few weeks actually. A few weeks. Now, is that it? Right, that seems to be about it. Right, so I, I, I know he's, right, I don't know if he, he's all working or whatever, a lot of these might be stuck in the house. Uh, but some of you might be working and possibly you've got kids and that, like Ryan I suppose. And, uh, I'll try and make this as easy for everybody as possible to get this completed. And through the tutorials, I'll be able to see the SQA like they know because they've done this, you know. Right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start going through the PowerPoints that I'll put up with on the middle with this uh, video. And if you just kind of go through the, the PowerPoints with me, that'd be great. So cable ratings and over cover current protection devices. One thing to look at is this is an electrician's bible or electrical engineer's bible when you're designing uh, systems and this has got all the regulations that you need to adhere to and you have to make sure that everything you do conforms to this otherwise if something goes wrong you're liable for it even if you didn't do it if somebody does some work and asks you to sign it off because you're qualified and it mucks up you're, you're in big trouble with it. so I'm going to have to get used to going through that book and I'm not expecting you to go and buy it because it's like 98 quid or something uh, there is kind of resources online you can look at specific parts of the book but uh, what I will do is I will photocopy bits of it as I've done that a little bit of and direct you in the right direction to look at whatever particular tables you need to look at to to work out whatever you need to do, voltage drop or the grouping of cables and stuff like that but we'll get to now Let's see. So, an overcurrent, a current exceeding the rated value. For a conductor's rated value is a current carrying capacity. So in other words, you've got a cable that allows you to carry. Maybe three amps. An overcurrent, if that creeps up to three point two amps, that's an overcurrent. And if overcurrents, it will kind of it will cause the cable to heat up. It can start degrading the. Uh, insulation. Well, I would say if it's over its, it's normal operating heat, it's going to cause problems with, uh, with uh, the sheath that surrounds your cable. Now, let's see. An overload current. An overload current is a, in a circuit which is electrically sound. Let's see. So this is a, a, a circuit that's been set up or, and it's got all the, the, it's been set up properly. So it's got the right rated uh, current carrying capability. But yet, there's still an overcurrent in the circuit. So there's maybe something wrong with a device or a machine or the supply has maybe went there's been a, a power surge or something like that. 
that's an overcurrent. And then, let's see, uh, short circuit current. This is when the, the cable, say it wasn't like wired up properly in your plug and it's a bit loose there and there's a wee bit of wire coming out here they get quite close together next thing you know there's a short circuit and a lot of times when you've got like small bits of metal they can actually like, fuse and, what, and uh, weld together actually because of a permanent connection which if it isn't uh, earthed properly if that isn't earthed properly, see it's, it's not right there and you get into contact with that you can get a shock because of that, a short circuit but a short circuit is basically a part of the circuit that uh, should be insulated or should come into contact and somehow they managed to come into contact. Even maybe if you some somehow say like maybe something was to compress a couple of cables, something metal, and that was to uh, cause problems with insulation. You might that would maybe a path for a short circuit, or or water. In fact, water is the worst one. You got fluid or water in a circuit. That can get into any nooks and crannies and see if you had I mean a totally sound circuit that's all wired up properly and if any water we'll use your plug sort of thing that's your device pump I mean water could just ease in a tiny little gap here or a tiny little gap here and a short circuit and it can blow your circuits blow it can cause overcurrent to get pulled in yep it's not good <laughs> and see the uh, the definitions of this are in your BS7671 which is your 18th edition wiring regulations it's called I'm not messing up BS7671 is your 18th edition and that's the latest one that if you're an electrician and you don't have that you cannot wire up any houses legally and uh, so you're not insured or anything like that now I'm on, quite, I'm on slide 6 by the way the effects of overload current right if you've got too much current going through a cable it's going to heat up get warmer that, that in fact causes the actual resistance to, to increase anyway so your impedance of your cable increases the hot it gets and this will cause your the sheath that's covering your cable whatever it's not very good drawing that you've got your cable there and your wee bit of insulation around it like that Oops. if this is too hot that will cause that kind of thermal plastic to kind of degrade and eventually if you've got a, a, a voltage will try and conduct if you've got a big enough voltage even if it's plastic or anything a big enough voltage will always cause conduction no matter what kind of insulation it is that's another story I suppose if you think about uh, clouds in the air like they're, they're insulated by the air but still if you get a big enough voltage poof, you will get lightning it will occur, you will get conduction and if you, okay, there's obviously if that insulation is degraded, not will only reduce the performance of your circuit, but there's, there's a chance that you could somehow touch that or come into contact with someone that is touching that and you get a shock, an electric shock from that. 
as you say, that's a symbol for a short circuit, actually. Uh, yep, and obviously any heat getting created. If you had two or three cables, a few cables together next to the device, any heat build up, as I say, that causes more resistance, which causes more problems, and this could cascade into maybe a fire even occurring. Or at least you would damage your equipment that you're using. But it's short circuit there generally because there's no resistance between the two conductors. It's a uh, it's going to be a very very high current generally. Some of the, the some of the short circuits you get in overhead cables are absolutely enormous, thousands of amps. But uh, but obviously very rapid increase in temperature. It's uh, it's like an overcurrent on steroids. And obviously let's see again it's got a damage and insulation, cause electric shock, damage the equipment that you're using. If you've got some sort of motor, if you've got a short circuit going in your motor, you've got loads that you've got things of windings, I'm sure you've looked at them. And they're small, if you put an overcurrent or a short circuit into there and your windings around your coil or whatever, that will that will destroy your windings and ruin your machine. Actually. And sparks can be created and that can cause a fire. Let's see. Now so you must rate your cable. And it must be able to uh, cope with uh, different environments. And like if you are using a cable and it's normal operating temperatures 70 degrees C and that's when you're in a, a house in Britain which is usually between 18 and 21 degrees C. If you go away to Africa or on a crater somewhere, and I know, so the, the ambient, that's what they call the ambient temperature. Oops, Mr. Emmett. If you go to a place with ambient temperatures like 34 to 40 degrees C, this will affect that table. You will have to, you, what you will have to do is you generally, if it's, if it's, if that's going to degrade the cable's carrying capability, you're going to have to use a bigger cable, basically. So it's got more scope, more, less uh, resistance or a higher rating of current carrying capability. Yep, and as it says here, the size of the cable are, and therefore it's current rating. So in other words, the bigger it is, the, the, the more current it can handle. So it's got a higher current rating. Yep. And if it's not big enough, it's going over here. As soon as that starts happening, you're going to have problems. Now the design current. Design current say what's the design current? Say you've got uh, three kilowatt shower. Uh, that's two forty volts. So your power, sorry, your current is going to be power over voltage. So three thousand over two hundred forty. This was at 6.4 or something like that amps. Right. And the right, see the protect the protective device. See so you had a breaker there or a fuse or a breaker 
or sorry, a breaker. You'd want that to be at least, like, probably about 7 amps or something like that. Or 8, something like that. But you, you, can, you can check these values that you need to use in the 18th edition. Tells you all that kind of stuff. And then, we have to find, once you, once you do this, you have to find IZ, which is the which is the current carrying capacity. And that's generally a lot bigger than the actual use that's designed for it. So you have to carry a lot more current than you need for the shop. But that's because of different factors that uh, determine the rating factor. So I want to slide 10 here. Right, this is a rating factor that must be applied when determining the current carrying capacitor or cable in relation to the method used to install it and other environmental factors. Right. When you have a cable, whenever you have a current flowing along that, you always have a magnetic and electric field created. M and E. Maybe not quite. Yeah, I could have maybe drawn that better, but. And you can't actually see that. Like ca cables are deceptive. You just look at them and go, you can't feel anything, but there's a lot of stuff going on around it we just can't feel. But like a mobile phone when it's ringing, you can't feel the magnetic and electric field, but there is one there. And uh, this causes. Like capacitance to occur, especially the capacitance causes like a resistance or impedance to the flow of the current. So now, if you have say this cable here, and you have another cable right next to it, and even maybe another cable right next to it. And sometimes you can't get away from this. If you're building a house and the cable's coming from one uh, part of the house, your supply, your meter or whatever, you can't have cables all going out in different directions and going to the individual uh, devices. It would, it would just probably cost too much. So what you do is you kind of group them all together in conduits or trays or something like that. And you split them up when you kind of get to the device that you need. So there's, there's generally you have to kind of group them together when you're just just because of the, the the way you have to wire houses up and if you go into like I don't know if you've ever been on a ship or that like so I've, I've been down the boat the the bungs of a ship and all the cables are on trays big massive trays going along and all that kind of thing so but all these have a kind of capacitance that interferes with each one of them. So say, say for instance, say you had the three there, you would look up the 18th edition, your BS7671, and that would say, right, that would give you this thing, that would say, uh, it's a C factor they call it, and it's grouping. So they will say, right, and then they group together. Yep. How many? Three. Are they lying side by side? Are they grouped together like that in a conduit sort of thing? And then it will say, right, here's a rating. So if that would maybe be like 0 0.8 or something like that. And see, you needed, see, you needed 10 amps from these cables. And you looked at your grouping thing. And see that could carry 10 amps. But now, wait a minute, so you need cables that will carry 10 amps, right? I've just said that. 
But if you look at the grouping of that, what you would find then is this 10 divided, you would divide the current you need by the grouping factor. And that ends up meaning that would be 10 divided by 0.8 is something like 12 or so. So if you have three cables that are together and you want to carry 10 amps down it, because they're grouped together, you must pick a cable. I'm just making these figures up, I'm just roughly doing this maybe. That would carry 12 amps purely because the three of these are grouped together like that. And all these different things are explained in the 18th edition. Now look at this, here we go there, there you go there, that's cable grouping, CG, that's what I was talking about there. And just to come around, just what I'm talking about, ambient temperature. And there you'll get a table for your ambient temperature we talked about. If you're in a very hot country, it's going to uh, change the characteristics or other and the rating of your cable. But also, and you and you will get depending on the temperature of the type of cable, the 18th edition will give you the give you the, the factor to adjust it and, and take into account the different uh, temperatures. And thermal insulation. And this is like to uh, ah, see, see if you're if you're insulated from heat, that creates more heat to be uh, created in the cable. See, if you've got a cable and you wrap it up in a thermal insulation, it's going to create more heat, and that will again affect its current rating. Of course. Right, and examples of rating factors here are semi enclosed fuse. Well, we know what a fuse is, don't we? Do you know what a fuse is, eh? I'm sure we've looked at a few, but we've not looked at it, but I'm sure you saw. So you've got a little wire, and you're going to go in there. so much current can go through that wire, and if it goes over that, it causes a heat build up, and that'll end up just snapping. Although it takes time for that to happen and sometimes yeah, the old fashioned wire fuses like we've got there aren't good enough because from the time the overcurrent or the short circuit or whatever starts to take effect it can take a little bit of time before the, the metal breaks and in that time it might be enough to kill you so it depends on what situation uh, Depends on what you need to use, and that's what's saying there. The, the rating factor of that using a semi enclosed fuse is 0 0.725. So, in other words, say you had a 10 amp 0 0.725, divide that by so it'll be your, your current divided by the, the the rating of the semi closed fuse, so that'll be 10 divided by 0 0.725. I'm not going to work it out, but that's probably 13.2 or something like that. You can see the difference all this makes to it. It's, it's actually unbelievable. Once you, you set up, you, you need 10 amps to start off, but you end up needing cables that can carry with 20 odd amps it's purely because of the, the installation, the way. The way uh, it's, uh, the cables react to each other. I'm on 15. And there you go. Uh, if you look at the BS, I'll try and hopefully you'll be able to get access to them. You will. But I, as I say, I will put these up. Uh, so other rated factors are found in BS 7671 and part 2 definitions. I'm sure I'll, uh, that's the ones I've, I've actually put. Right. What next is? What next is? You got a voltage drop. 
a few of a wee bulb and it's like 10 meters away say it was a 24 volt and it works at it works between 22 24 so in other words if it goes below 22 which is what's that like about three to five percent it won't work now see that loses every meter that loses 0 0.1 volt so that would lose one volt to there so you get to a length where see that was 25 meters it would lose enough voltage there so that would be down about 20 volts or something like that so that wouldn't light purely because there's a voltage drop that's too big from your source to your device or your supply I suppose they would call it that Aye. and again this is an 18th edition it's got everything in it and uh, as it says here on slide 16 generally it must not be more than 3% or or lower than 3% for motors and stuff like that and no that's for, for lighting circuits and like, like your motor you, you, don't, you won't want it to be higher or lower because it will cause problems with your circuitry and, that, and it, will, it will ruin your machine basically the L4 earth fault loop impedance this is the impedance if there is kind of any kind of fault like a short circuit or something like that and it needs to travel to earth right? it has to be it has to be uh, it's, it has to be low, very low as we've said before in other the other course is that uh, a human is about one mega ohm in general and if the if, uh, earth loop impedance was, was, was relatively big even the 30 or 40 ohms it would probably cause you to get a good shock off that so you want, you want your earth loop impedance to be quite low or as low as possible basically just a second Right, so the air fault loop impedance. Yeah, but this is dependent on the conductor in your circuit plus what they call the CPC. CPC. And that's your your air wire basically. And that protects everybody and all your devices in the circuit. Must be low enough to resolve a current which is high enough to properly operate a protective device. So you have to be able to get some sort of current there if there is a fault to operate the protective device. Right. Right, selection the cable based on the cross sectional area of the protective conductor. See remember that The amount of current your cable can take can take is determined on the area, this cross-sectional area. So obviously the bigger that is, the more current it can handle. And yeah, so when you when you work out what sort of current that might occur, you Look at the 18th edition and that will tell you what sort of cross-sectional area the CPC must be. To uh, So it must be bigger than the conditions set in the, the, the 18th edition. Right. Over current, over current protection devices, we have fuses, the wire, as we just talked about, 
and circuit breakers. They are operated by magnetic circuits, a magnetic uh, field. And once it's a change in that, that is detected by the circuit breakers and that will that'll break the circuit. But also there's, there's, uh, there's different features of the circuit breakers, which are quite interesting. But let's have a little look at fuses first. So say that's it's got an element, in other words, a small wire. Usually if they're fully enclosed, like the wee fuses you get on your, your, your plugs and things, it will have a, a powder in here. Well, a lot of them are, are, don't have much, but if you see you're using quite a high, uh, if you've got a high current going through this, you have powder there to absorb the flash over when that, when that breaks, actually. Whenever you break a circuit, you always get the like, arcing that occurs. Now, this powder, usually a silicate, absorbs over. But a lot of these ones, there's actually nothing there. A lot of smaller ones, like your, your 13 amp ones and stuff. And again, if, uh, if there's too much current for too long a time, that will melt and break. It breaks the circuit. And that's it, the other cartridge, fuse element. And as I say, a lot of your smaller ones are, there's nothing in there. But in, uh, say if you are your ones for your cars, so you've maybe got 80 amps going through in your circuit from your, your, your battery to your your motors, your, you have big, huge, well not huge, but that size, uh, and they're full of this silicate stuff, because you've got a massive flash or something like that. Right, a semi-closed fuse, that's like the ones you, you kind of used to get them, in the old circuits, in your house, old uh, circuit boxes in your house, the fuse boards in your house, you don't get them anymore, and if the fuse is broken you would you take it out and just wire it put a wire against it again and put it back in and obviously that's not enclosed so that's why as we looked at earlier the, the rate it causes the rating factor to change by nearly a, nearly a quarter because it's 0 0.725 or something like that was your your rating of that Uh, this is just talking about your your fuse cartridges, your cartridge fuses, like the ones we use. It's talked about, and this is the ones I was on about. With your like high current machines, such as your electric car or a big pump or something like that, in an industrial setting, They're quite cheap. Which is good, uh, they've got no moving parts, so they'll, they'll always work, hopefully. The limitations we can be placed with wrong rating, if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, especially the rewirable ones, the semi-enclosed, it's easy just to pick the wrong wire, put the wrong wire in. Pure discrimination, it doesn't, it can't tell if it's a short circuit or, or an overcurrent. That's what that means. Uh, now, MCBs. CBs. They're quite interesting. It's an over current protection device and it's a breaker. So if it's a short circuit, it will break the current. But if it's an over current, it will break the current as well. It works. It's, it's quite ingenious. Yeah, but it's got two mechanisms. Like a fuse, it opens a forward current circuit when the current flow exceeds its rated value for a period of time. And also, if you have a short circuit, it will cut it. That's how we look at this thing. I hope you can see this. But you'll be able to see this sort of slide 30 here. What we have is the contact thing. And this is going to your pump or whatever. And then, this is like a wee arm thing, something like that, right, it's got a wee movable bit there, so this thing can move up and down, in other words it can break the circuit, and that's your, 
that's your fixed kind of supply or so in other words if these two bits if that kind of looks like that so there's a gap there that's the socket broken so it breaks it at the bottom there when it goes to the load right now we have our thing our trip lever right and now this thing up here that pulls that away from it right and so what and what we also have is this thing here I'm not drawing this very well, but you'll see in the diagram in the slide I mean, a wee kind of solenoid thing here, a wee coil Now Let's go through that Now, a, a solenoid is Remember what you are talking about, like a magnetic field If you put a magnetic field and you have a, a bit of metal in it, it will push the metal out Or it can pull it back in Or like Faraday's induction where you move it it causes an electric field to occur but it, or, or a magnetic field but that the, the opposite happens if you make a magnetic field or an electrical field occur in the coil it'll move the metal it'll cause a force which pulls it that in this case it pulls it that way so what happens here if there's a short circuit going through this circuit what will happen is the this activates and pulls that and breaks the circuit right and this pulls us down here that way and breaks the circuit whereas if there's an overcurrent in other words it's not it doesn't go happen like that poof, really quickly it takes a bit of time and this bimetallic strip heats up and again moves that way and pushes this away and trips the contact between it so in other words if you've got an overcurrent and it happens long enough it will move it will move it'll trip it but if there's a short circuit it trips it instantly so it's just quite ingenious actually yeah. so that's what i say and gradual overcurrents any sudden high value Fault currents flowing through the trip coil of the device will cause the magnetic field to create, and this will operate the magnetic tripping mechanism of the device. In other words, the solenoid. A more gradual overcurrents, the and that causes the it heats up, and it manages, it causes the bi metal strip to operate the tripping mechanism. See, see what that means is. A bimetal strip means if you've got two a strip with two metals of different types, uh, when they overheat, one will stretch further than the other one. So what happens is, I see that was just a sticking out there. What would happen is if that stretched like less and that stretched more this would end up bending up like that you see and that moves because because of two different types of metals it moves it because of the 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 difference in the amount of of stretching or what is it when heat metal it, it, it increases it gets longer it's like when you look at power lines in the, the summer or kind of like that you know, they're sagging because they're longer because it's hotter but in the in the winter the power lines are, are kind of like straighter because it's colder so they don't stretch as much or, or like they contract because it's cold so it's the same thing that happens with this bimetallic strip right I always say you'll have it says there you have a manual you'll be able to trip it yourself there'll be 
button on it. You can trip just to test it. So it's your tamper proof. That's uh, hard to mock about with it. Uh, the tripping characteristics are set during manufacture. That's it. So they calibrate it around for you. So it should be bang on. If our ISO register does. <laughs> and they're a bit more expensive than normal and you need to test them every so often. That's why uh, the council goes out and tests your yeah, electrical circuits every year now, I think. Was it 18 months or something like that? And you have to choose appropriate overcurrent protection device. It must have a high enough, if you need 26 amps, you're going to use a 30 amp one. And if it says 1.4 ohms maximum for your ZS or your earth fault loop impedance, you want it to be less than that. So the device will protect the circuit that's supplying 11, it's using 11 amps, maximum ZS is 1.9. So if you look at table 413 or 412 from the British Standard, or I, the 18th edition, it will tell you what sort of uh, MCB to use or what sort of fuse to use. I'm just roughly quickly going over this. Uh, I'll put a kind of tutorial up and I will make a wee video of me going through this on the on the 18th edition. So you can get get an idea of, a better idea of what's going on here. Right, and is that it? Well there, there's a table there. That's a table you use, I can't actually see that, 413, and it's got the different ratings there, the different uh, air fault loop impedances, and from that it'll tell you what MCB to use, that's for the MCB there. Okay, right. That's us kind of just getting started with this. We went through quite a bit actually. And uh, I'll send you a tutorial, tutorial to go with this. And I'll maybe give you some more notes as well. And I'll photocopy some more of the relevant tables and stuff. And I think that's about it, to be honest. Cheers for listening. And uh, hopefully I'll see you all soon. Okay? Take care now.